Hello, and thank you to Design Incubation and Seton Hall for the opportunity to share some of my research today, and thank you to all of you who have joined in and are listening. The research I will be discussing examines the history, practice, and pedagogy of typography. Typography is at the core of design, both implicit and explicit in its role in upholding or disrupting dynamics of power. Who can read it? Who uses it? Who made it? Whose voice does it carry? Human, machine, the included, or the excluded? But the field is rooted in predominantly white, male, Eurocentric, or modernist systems and structures that determine how we construct language and communicate. The past several years have seen a growing movement with increasing momentum to decolonize design, with amazing work being published and produced by folks like Silas Monroe and the Polymode Studio team, Dory Tunstall, Ramon Tejada, Louis Soundhouse, Neven Southall, Briar Levitt, Tashika Arsino Sutton, Arturo Escobar, Ian Lynham, Pierre and Bowens, Natalia Ilian, Kelly Walters, and many more. These are just a handful of examples. The very notion of decolonizing type is massive in its scope, from its history to its design, application, technology, and future. It's impossible to cover this subject with the thoroughness it really deserves in just six minutes, and the research I'm presenting today is by no means all-encompassing or complete. The questions I find myself constantly asking are, how do we broaden and reframe the structures and systems that exist in order to make room for oppressed and marginalized voices and make more inclusive the societies in which we live? And even beyond making the necessary space for inclusivity, how do we shift, rebuild, or reimagine an entire system of thinking and making in order to create a future world of many worlds? Due to brevity, I will briefly go over some ideas surrounding reframing and reimagining typographic systems, and we'll afterwards share a workshop that I'm currently running with my students at DePaul that explores some of this thinking. In thinking of a place to kind of dive in, I thought we'd start with the past. Modern history has characteristically been approached through a lens that assumes linearity, from simple to complex, presenting a chronology that focuses on Western notions of progress and development, and that ultimately canonizes design heroes. In terms of typography, if we look at our established structure, it organizes history under typographic classifications. The system, which was actually recently adopted by A Type I, coupled with broader classification of type as either Latin or non-Latin, is ultimately closed, exclusive, and perpetuates not only stylistic heroes, but design heroes. This is then perpetrated and preserved in our classrooms and even disseminated and petrified like a fossil in our technology via system fonts and the lack of accessibility for most to a broader, more global typographic landscape, and in the making and applying of typography in terms of availability of technology for a variety of languages, as well as the support and development of tech for those languages, from leading design software producers like Adobe, or office applications like Word, Pages, etc., and the web. You should also consider the monopoly of power over technology and the narrative it favors. In a series of articles on Arabic typography and justification, Titus Nemeth states machinery and industrial manufacturing processes favor modular concepts and systematic organization, which are also foundational modernist tenets alongside partiality to grids, functionalism, geometry, and neutrality. Over the past several years, much like the push to decolonize design, we've seen an increasing push towards diversifying the field of typography with, for example, the work of Trey Seals at Vocal Type, who designs typefaces that carry the voices of historically marginalized communities. Juan Villanueva's new platform, Typefaces as Cultural Objects, a resource that collects typefaces and letter forms by Latin American designers. Joe Malinis recently launched Type 63, a platform for both showcasing and activating the Filipino type design community. FemType, and similarly, Alphabets, two platforms created to celebrate, support, and promote the work of type designers who identify as women. And we can also look at the work of individual designers like Charlotte Road, whose work asks, what do typefaces have to say beyond the words they spell? And Asa Waraikul Karni, whose typeface Nari asks, what does it mean for a typeface to be feminist? In thinking about technology, I would also like to highlight the work of indigenous designer Sebastian Aubant, who created Baja, the first Cree monospace font intended for coding, which asks, can a monospace Cree syllabic font change the way we interact with machines and the way they interact with us? In my own work, I'm interested in how typography can act as a vehicle for storytelling and reframing histories. 
Louisa, for example, named after speed typing champion Rose Louisa Fritz, is an upright italic monospace font with swashes. Inspired by the romance that punctuates the history of the typewriter, it is both an ode to those art forms that have been set aside as feminine and an attestation of the typewriter's role in women's entry to the American corporate labor force. A common thread in the work presented is the significance of identity and voice in design, and work that is relational, connected to place, community, and lived experiences. In Teaching to Transgress, Bell Hook states that our capacity to generate excitement is deeply affected by our interest in one another, in hearing one another's voices, and in recognizing one another's presence. As an educator, I often find myself asking what rules and conventions are worth perpetuating or keeping. But perhaps a better question is how we can begin to imagine and build a system that is not fixed, but open to constant evolution and hybridity of voices. I think a significant place to start is in the classroom. If we can shift how we teach typography, we can work from the inside out to reshape our futures. As a result of this research, I have been experimenting through trial and error mostly, how we can begin to incorporate each other's voices and create an evolving dialogue with which to explore, understand, and use type in the classroom. This quarter, I'm running the third iteration of a workshop with my advanced type students, where they explore the, from the individual to the collective, contextualizing their lived typographic experiences across time and space. For the first part, students collect typographic artifacts or images of these artifacts from within their living spaces and communities this step is all about introspection and awareness, asking them to think about how we live and interact with typography every day. The second step is a cataloging session where we gather physically and digitally all of the collected artifacts and tag them by style, function, and voice using both existing systems of categorization and more importantly, coming up with our own, then analyzing our results. Lastly, through guided research, students explore what past presidents, if any, led to the creation of their artifacts and what voices the typography carries. By using time as a focal point of reference, students research the political, cultural, and social circumstances that orbit their typographic artifacts. The workshop is intended for students or new practitioners to explore the contextual relationships of typography through their own lived experiences. To wrap up, I'll end with a couple of questions that I'm still working on answering, much like most of the ones I presented today, and did not have an opportunity to dive in for this presentation. How can we teach our students to not only use typography across a multiplicity of mediums, but to speculate and imagine typographic systems outside of our current constructed realities? And how do we work towards a multi-scriptural typographic landscape, both ethically and respectfully? I'm very interested in running and developing the Living Typographies Workshop outside of my own classroom. If anyone is interested, please do not hesitate to reach out for either the workshop or to discuss this research further. Thank you.